Thanks, yeah. Shamya. Uh, <clears throat> so thank you, everyone, uh, for showing up for the last talk of the day. Uh, you know, it's been a long day. So I'll be talking about some techniques uh, for handling uh, unbalanced data sets uh, in your classification tasks. So a number of uh, classification problems need to deal with uh, class imbalance amongst, uh, amongst the various classes. And we, we say we have a class imbalance problem when one class uh, has a significantly higher or lower representation in our training uh, data set distribution. And often in these problems, um, or at least the kind of problems that I'll be focusing on, the performance on the minority class is uh, what we really care about. And if you take your favorite classifier and feed it uh, this unbalanced data set, this, uh, you might not get the performance that, um, that you're looking for. So we'll see uh, some ways um, of um, mitigating that, uh, that problem. So some examples, uh, the, the, the quintessential example that comes to mind is fraud detection. So you have a lot of transactions coming in. Uh, say you're a finance company uh, like PayPal. Uh, a small number of these transactions uh, would be fraudulent, but most of them would be genuine. And if you want to build a classifier that identifies fraudulent transactions, you would have a data imbalance problem. Uh, the next example, which is close to the domain that I work in uh, at Walmart, is product categorization. So say you're a retailer and you sell a lot of products, say you sell iPhones and you sell iPhone accessories. Uh, typically, if you're optimizing for revenue, you would want uh, users coming to your website to be able to find the iPhones uh, and uh, at the cost of uh, some iPhone accessory uh, buyers uh, seeing some iPhone uh, also in their result. <coughs> Another example would be disease diagnosis. Uh, it's a fair assumption that uh, for any given disease, uh, most people are healthy, and uh, the, the fraction of people who have the disease is typically small. And there are a lot of examples uh, like this. Uh, if you browse the UCI machine learning uh, data set repository, you'll see a lot of uh, examples uh, of unbalanced data set. <clears throat> So this uh, talk is basically going to be a survey of uh, some techniques uh, which are going to be presented via a case study on a synthetic data set. And the main, uh, main kinds of techniques that we'll talk about are uh, either you modify the loss function, uh, so machine learning problems essentially boil down to minimizing some uh, loss function on your data set. Uh, but, and we'll see how to modify uh, the loss function and get better, uh, better performance. The other thing you can do is modify the data set itself, which would form the bulk of the talk. Uh, this includes uh, resampling techniques. And finally, we'll finish with a couple of ensemble methods. So just to fix some notation, we'll denote the majority class uh, by L. We'll, we'll basically be uh, talking uh, with reference to a two-class classification problem. So there are two classes, L and S, where L is the majority class and S is the minority class. And abusing notation, we'll basically use it both for the set of examples uh, in the majority class and also the class label itself. Um, now, I know uh, Florian gave a talk earlier of having a single metric, but just for the purposes of this discussion, uh, the objectives that we want on the data set is to have a high recall on the minority class and high precision on the majority class. And you can combine these two metrics into a single metric by taking either the geometric mean or harmonic mean. And there are a lot of other uh, techniques that are proposed in literature that can capture this intent of uh, quantifying better performance on the minority class. Uh, now, why, why does this objective make sense? So uh, typically, uh, again, with reference to the examples that were on the slide earlier, uh, if, if you're detecting fraud, then uh, you would like to ha catch all the fraudulent transactions, catch all of them if possible, at the risk of uh, potentially flagging some genuine transactions and fraudulent. Because the next step of the process is uh, typically an analyst who is going to review those transactions. And uh, if a few genuine transactions slip through that, that's something that we can deal with. But fraudulent transactions uh, getting missed have a much higher cost. <coughs> so just to recap, uh, precision and recall here. So precision is the fraction of things that we classify as the majority class that we get correct. And uh, recall on the minority class just means that the fraction of items that, were, that are actually in the minority class get flagged as minority class. <clears throat> 
So uh, most of this uh, talk is, um, I mean, being a PyData talk is done in Python, the, the talk itself, and uh, all the visualizations and all the uh, machine learning uh, machine learning models that are built are in Python. So we're basically using uh, scikit-learn for building models. Uh, we're using matplotlib for doing visualization. And uh, the, the main uh, focus of the talk, which is these um, balancing techniques, these uh, come from this uh, library called uh, imbalanced learn. So that's the IMB learn uh, that you're seeing. <coughs> so uh, let's, let's first generate a synthetic data set. So, Scikit-learn has this uh, method called make classification, which you can use to generate all kinds of data set. It was, uh, uh, it's, it's based upon uh, this challenge uh, from um, uh, Neural Information Processing Conference from, I think, 2003. Uh, you, you can specify a lot of parameters here. You, you can specify how your classes are separated. That's the uh, 1.2 that's captured here. Uh, the weights we are using uh, is 0.1 and 0.9. This just means that the number of items in the majority class are nine times that in the minority class. Now, we can have a significantly more skewed distribution than this. So I personally dealt with data sets where uh, the ratio of majority to minority class was uh, anywhere from 100 to uh, 10,000. And we can handle a lot of uh, those problems using these methods as well. But in the interest of being able to visualize a lot of these data sets, uh, let's go with a somewhat uh, more manageable uh, class distribution. Uh, we'll generate 10,000 samples, uh, and uh, we'll basically generate two clusters. And there are some uh, other parameters that you can tweak to get the kind of data set that you want. Uh, the next thing we do is split the data set into 70% training and 30% training, uh, sorry, 30% testing. We'll uh, train our models on the 70% and see the performance on the holdout uh, test set. So how does this data look like? So if you see uh, the orange dots represent the majority class and the blue dots uh, represent the minority class. And the way it stands right now, uh, it, uh, it's clear that the majority class is overwhelming the data set. <coughs> But the data still forms two fairly distinct clusters. And if we care about performance on the minority class, say we are using a linear classifier, we kind of have an idea of where we would like our decision boundary to be uh, to be able to capture most of the minority class examples. So let's, let's see uh, what we get right out of the box. So uh, let's use logistic regression from scikit-learn. We'll do five-fold cross-validation to search for the best parameters. Here are the parameters that I am optimizing for include the penalty, whether it's uh, L1 uh, penalty or L2, and uh, the regularization parameter uh, over a few set of values. <coughs> so if we do this, uh, we get the best parameters and we get the uh, logistic regression decision boundary. And this is the boundary that we get. You see that most of the examples uh, are on one side of the boundary, regardless of what class they are in. So this, this doesn't really do justice uh, to the kind of objectives that we have. Uh, if you look at the performance on the test set, so uh, I'll, I'll be having these kind of uh, visualizations and metrics for most of the techniques. Uh, the main thing to focus on are the diagonal entries, the first two diagonal entries. So the precision on the uh, majority class is not great. It's 90%. And the recall on the minority class is really poor. It's just 12%. So let, let's see uh, what using some of these techniques buys us. So the first is uh, asymmetric loss functions. So as I said, machine learning problems boil down to defining some kind of a loss function that uh, you uh, run an optimization algorithm on to try and minimize. In the case of uh, logistic regression, you have this um, negative uh, conditional log likelihood that you're trying to minimize. And uh, the, the, the cost, uh, the logistic uh, sigmoid function is symmetric. The cost of uh, making a misclassification uh, uh, one way or the other, it basically costs the same. Uh, but we can modify that, and we can attach a weight to each class. <coughs> and if we do that, uh, we can so somehow encode the information that we want to, uh, we, we care more about the performance on the minority class in this instance. So scikit-learn provides a way to do this uh, using the class weight parameter. 
So here we use uh, the balanced, uh, our, uh, balanced value for this parameter. There are uh, custom weights that you can choose. The balanced heuristic uh, basically tries to uh, attach weights that are inversely proportional to the size of uh, your, um, to the size of the class. <coughs> so um, it, it essentially uh, is trying to um, convey the information that we care more about the minority class because, um, because of the inverse proportionality. And if we do that, we already see that we get a much better, uh, much better decision boundary. So if we look at the performance on the test class, uh, test set that's reflected here, uh, now we get a precision on the majority class, which is 98%, which is better than what we got doing nothing at all. And the recall on the minority class has significantly improved to 89%. So that, that's, uh, that's all I wanted to talk about regarding modifying the loss function. The next set of techniques uh, would be about resampling the data set. And the first few of those would be about undersampling the majority class. So the, the simplest thing that you can do is randomly undersample. So you treat each uh, point in the majority class like any other and just randomly choose to ignore uh, some of the points. So here uh, we see that there are a lot of blue points, uh, there are a lot of orange points, and we randomly choose to ignore some of them. <coughs> so this, this can uh, cause a problem uh, because we can sometimes lose uh, informative examples, so especially if, um, if you have a lot of outliers. So in this case, we have this outlier. Uh, our uh, algorithm didn't really undersample it, but um, if you, if you run it again with another random seed, you might lose that. So that is the main problem. But if your data set is such that every uh, example in the majority class is surrounded by other examples of the majority class, then it might not be such a bad thing to do. So uh, now uh, this is where the imbalanced learn library comes into play. This, so the first line in most of these slides is going to be the method that we are using. So this is just a random undersampler. And then there's this um, ratio parameter, which basically says, uh, what is the ratio we want of minority class to majority class? So uh, at the bottom, if you look at the distribution, um, after, before undersampling, uh, we had 6,300 6, examples in the majority class and 700 odd in the minority class. After undersampling, the majority class examples goes down to about 1,300. So now when we look at uh, visualization of the training set, we can clearly identify how the minority class looks like. And we, we can definitely be able to draw a much better uh, decision boundary, which is what logistic regression is able to do on this resampled data set. And if you look at the performance on um, the test set, we get 97% precision, which is about the same as uh, with weighted classes and 82% recall on the minority class. <clears throat> so these are, these are two, uh, I mean, the, the first things that you could try, which are fairly simple and fairly easy to understand. And uh, a lot of times, these, uh, the performance with these two techniques is quite hard to beat. Now we'll see some uh, more sophisticated ways of uh, doing um, undersampling or oversampling which might not necessarily give a better performance on this data set, but might perform better on some other data set. So the first uh, of those is a family of techniques called near miss. So most of these techniques are based on the nearest neighborhood um, kind of argument. So you, you try to uh, find examples to either select or deselect based on how close they are to certain other examples. So the first technique is near miss one. So here you retain points uh, from the majority class whose mean distance to um, k nearest points in the minority class is the lowest. So you take uh, all examples in the majority class, rank order them based on their uh, distances, mean distances to their k nearest neighbors, and then depending on what kind of um, undersampling ratio you want to achieve, uh, you choose to ignore uh, the, the top few. And with near miss one, uh, it, it tends to uh, basically lose or tends to retain points which are close to the boundary between the two classes. So if you have data set like this, it might not really do well. And as we'll soon see, it doesn't. Uh, so again, the first line is the algorithm um, for undersampling. Uh, the ratio, again, we want to use 0.5. The size neighborhood here is three. So some of these uh, values of these parameters are tunable. 
part, um, the, the choices that I'm making now are what were made in the original papers. So most of these techniques uh, come from fairly highly cited papers uh, on, this, uh, on this topic. And um, th that's uh, the kind of choices that they made or what worked from them is a good starting point. So let's see what kind of data set that we get after undersampling. So as we see, uh, the points that are retained, most of them are uh, so tend to be overlapping with uh, the minority class examples. And as a result, the decision boundary is not that great. It essentially has the same kind of distribution on either side. On, on, the, on the minority, uh, sorry, on the test set, you get a precision of 92% on the majority class and a recall of uh, only 32% on the minority class, which is much worse than the two simple methods that we saw earlier. A slightly better way of doing this is near miss 2, which uh, basically does the same kind of thing, except instead of looking at the nearest point, it looks at the k farthest points in the, in the minority class. And again, uh, depending on what ratio you want to achieve, it ignores uh, the first few examples. So uh, near miss 2 tends to retain points which are sort of at the center of the clusters, uh, which is what you see here. So this outlier and these points which are overlapping with the minority class, they are gone. And we have this uh, much uh, cleaner cluster uh, that you get. So this, this can work uh, well in some cases. Uh, so let's see how it does on the data set that we have. Again, we use uh, a neighborhood of three and the same ratio for undersampling. So if you look at the undersampled data set, you see most of the points which are uh, close to the center get preserved. So essentially what it's trying to do is preserve points which are close to all the points in the minority class. <clears throat> uh, if you look at the performance on the test set, uh, the precision gets is improved over near miss one. It's, it's still not as good as either undersampling, random undersampling, or uh, weighted classes. And uh, the recall on the minority class is uh, almost twice as much as near miss one, but still nowhere near what we get by doing uh, weighting or random undersampling. Finally, a third variant is uh, near miss three, in which you basically pick uh, k nearest neighbors of every point in the minority class. The, uh, in this case, you might, uh, I mean, actually you wouldn't be able to choose uh, an undersampling ratio because uh, that's uh, codified in this, um, in this parameter k. And a lot of times uh, there is an overlap between the, the nearest neighbors of uh, two different points. And so uh, you, you might uh, get uh, more undersampling than you desire. Uh, the library that we use here implements a slight variant of the near miss algorithm uh, than what is described in the paper, but at the ratio that we have chosen, sorry, at the size neighborhood that we have chosen, it doesn't really matter. If you look at the distribution after undersampling, it's um, close to, uh, I don't know, it's close to uh, one uh, instead of 0.5. And uh, if you visualize the data set, we see a lot of um, positive example, a lot of majority class examples surrounding minority class examples. Again, doesn't give a very cleaner representation of the decision boundary. And again, reflected on the test set, uh, only 91% precision on the majority class and the recall on the minority class is pretty bad. So they, they, uh, the original paper looked at this technique on uh, some other problems and uh, their uh, their finding was near miss two tends to perform uh, slightly better than random undersampling. Uh, and performs much better than near miss one and near miss uh, three. Another nearest neighborhood uh, based technique is condensed nearest neighbor. So condensed nearest neighbors basically tries to ignore uh, points from the majority class which uh, are close to other points in the majority class. So what it does is uh, you, you start with your training set and you start uh, growing the undersampled data set. So let's call that U. And initially, you just choose a random point uh, from the training set and uh, call it U. Uh, after that, you basically scan the remaining points in the training set and see if uh, they are correctly classified by their nearest neighbors in the undersampled set. So initially, when you have just one point, you see you look at the first point in the remaining set, see uh, whether it has the same class, uh, whether uh, it has the same class uh, as the point in U. 
If it uh, does, then you move, uh, then you deselect that, and if it doesn't, then you add it to add it uh, to uh, u, and you keep repeating this process until uh, u is maximal. And a, a variant of this technique, which is uh, what is implemented in the library, is to just undersample uh, the majority class using this technique and not the entire training set. So if you look at uh, this cartoon, uh, we see that. These points that are in the center, their closest uh, neighbors have the same class as them, and so these get uh, removed after undersampling. One problem with uh, condensed nearest neighbor, or actually two problems, uh, one of them is uh, because we are growing this with some random point selected uh, from the training set, the, the entire uh, selection procedure becomes random, and so it tends to be high variance uh, algorithm. Uh, the other problem is we are going through repeated scans of the data set, and uh, that if for large data sets, that can be a problem. So uh, in the algorithms that I present here, uh, the condensed nearest neighbor takes the longest uh, to get the undersampled data set. So uh, there are no real parameters to tune here. We just run condensed nearest neighbors. Uh, the ratio uh, after undersampling that we get is close to one, slightly more examples in the majority class. And uh, again, it, it tends to preserve, uh, at least for this data set, it preserves uh, points uh, in the majority class which are close to the decision boundary just because anything which is far off, most of the points that were here, their nearest neighbor in the majority class, uh, these are the points that get retained and uh, their nearest neighbors happen to be of the same class. <clears throat> Uh, performance on the test set is uh, not very encouraging uh, for this problem. So 93% precision on the majority class and only 39% recall on the minority class. A variant of condensed nearest neighbors is edited nearest neighbors. So here the idea is to remove examples uh, whose class label differs from a majority of its k nearest neighbor. It so, sort of does a complementary job to what nearest neighbors does. And uh, a variant of this is to keep doing that. Um, so you, you, you run one pass of the edited nearest neighbors and then keep doing that until you can no longer edit out any points from the data set. So here the first step does uh, shows one pass of edited nearest neighbors. So all these points uh, uh, that, so this point got removed because it has one neighbor which has a different class. And uh, yeah, that's basically the case. So here, the points get removed here because two of their neighbors have different classes. And the final step shows what we get after performing um, uh, repeated edited nearest neighbors, after which we can no longer edit out anything. So here, everybody has uh, neighbors which are of the same class. So edited nearest neighbors can uh, perform well, especially in combination with some other techniques that we'll talk about subsequently. So the first step of edited nearest neighbors we implement with a neighborhood of uh, five. And after resampling, we don't really reduce the, uh, the majority class significantly. We only lose about 1,200 examples. And uh, if you look at the visualization, it actually looks uh, to be doing, um, or it seems to be heading on the right track. Uh, we can clearly see examples from the minority class. There are a few examples from the majority class which are on the wrong side of the decision boundary, which uh, kind of messes up the performance. But uh, this looks like a good first step. Uh, in terms of performance on the test set, it's not um, uh, as good as uh, some of the other methods. We only get a recall of 59% uh, of the minority class. But if we do repeated edited nearest neighbors, we see some improvement in performance. So now, uh, after doing repeated uh, edited nearest neighbors, we lose another 500 examples from the majority class. And if you look at the resample data set, now the, um, the, the, the cluster of uh, minority class samples is much cleaner. Uh, there are still some examples from the majority class here, but uh, this, this is still uh, um, a significant improvement over just editor nearest neighbors. And uh, if, uh, if you look at the performance in the test set, that's uh, probably the best performance we have gotten um, 
uh, except for the random undersampling and weighted classes. So we get uh, to up to 80% recall on the minority class. And we'll, we'll come back to these methods uh, in a few minutes. The next method which has had uh, a lot of success uh, in some applications is Tomek link removal. So Tomek link is basically a pair of uh, examples in your training set which are each other's nearest neighbors but which have different um, class labels. So uh, here, uh, these points that you see are uh, Tomek links. So uh, the undersampling strategy is to basically remove examples which are from Atomic Link. And a variant is to just remove majority class examples which are members of Atomic Links. So the idea behind this is uh, if, if you are part of Atomic Link, then either you are on the boundary between two classes, so uh, points which are close to the boundary tend to have a neighbor which is of the opposite class, or you are, you are a noisy example. So you are a minority class example surrounded by members of the majority class or vice versa. So we can get rid of these noisy examples and borderline examples and get a much cleaner description of the decision boundary. Uh, in our case, it doesn't seem to have that big an effect simply because it doesn't achieve a lot of uh, undersampling. And uh, that's partly because there are not a lot of atomic links in this data set. And again, uh, we'll, we'll revisit this in combination with some other techniques. So uh, the undersampled data set only loses about 250 or so points. Uh, yeah, so in terms of the visualization, there is not much difference from the raw data set. And again, that's reflected in the performance on the test set. We only get 21% uh, recall on the minority class. The other side of the spectrum is oversampling. So you can, um, you, you want to basically reduce the importance of the minority class relative, uh, of the majority class relative to the minority class. You can achieve this by doing undersampling of the majority class, or alternatively you can oversample examples from the minority class. And the problem with this is that it may lead to overfitting. You are essentially counting the same examples uh, so many times, depending on what kind of uh, oversampling ratio you want. So if we do random oversampling here, again with the ratio of 0.5, now you see that the number of examples in the majority class don't change, and the number of examples in the minority class is about 3,000. In terms of visualization, you're not going to see anything different because the new points, the new blue points are on top of other blue points. In terms of performance, it uh, can perform uh, fairly well on some data sets. So here we get 97% precision on majority class and 76% recall on minority class, which is better than a lot of methods, but still worse than uh, both random undersampling and weighted classes. A more sophisticated way of doing oversampling is uh, what is called SMOT. So this, uh, uh, this was a paper by uh, Nilesh Shaula, and it had a lot of uh, success in a lot of applications. Uh, the, the vanilla version of SMOTE that we try uh, doesn't perform that well on this data set, but there are a lot of uh, variants that have been proposed in literature. So the basic idea, again, it's a nearest neighborhood-based uh, technique. You pick an example from, uh, from the minority class. You uh, choose k of its nearest neighbors. k is a hyperparameter that you can tune. And then randomly choose r of those k neighbors with replacement. So the same example get, can get chosen uh, many times. And now for each of these chosen uh, neighbors, uh, consider the line joining your original point and the chosen point, And then just add a synthetic example which lies on this line. So this is a way of adding new examples which don't overfit. The idea is that uh, if there are any examples uh, that uh, we missed during our sampling process, uh, then they would lie close to other examples of the same class. So here on the cartoon uh, data set, you see uh, th this point gets added between these two. This, uh, there is some overlap here that you see. Uh, there was no point here that got added. And uh, uh, yeah, some of the other points are not very clear, but uh, th that's where the the new points are uh, uh, added. <clears throat> so if we run SMOT with uh, five nearest neighbors to achieve uh, a sampling ratio of 0.5, uh, we see a, a slightly, uh, I don't know how clear it is, but uh, there, there are a lot of examples uh, that get added between two other examples. So 
Um, the minority class looks more fluid now. And let's see the performance on the minority class. Um, it does slightly better than just random oversampling, 1% uh, better than random oversampling, while still maintaining the same precision on the majority class. And as I alluded to earlier, uh, you can combine any of these two techniques. You can combine uh, any technique here with any other. But uh, there are a lot of uh, combinations that have been experimented with in literature um, that, uh, that have had some success. So a couple that I review here are uh, SMOT followed by atomic link removal uh, or SMOT followed by edited nearest neighbors. So if we do SMOT followed by atomic link removal, it just, uh, I mean, there's no other uh, magic to it other than just running the two, um, two techniques in, uh, in sequence. Uh, you see the data set that you get, uh, the, the classifier that you get has, uh, is doing much better. And again, reflected in the performance, this does better than either SMOT or uh, automatic link remover by itself. You get 80% recall on the minority class. SMOT uh, uh, followed by edited nearest neighbors, uh, again, achieving a ratio of 0.5 with a size uh, neighborhood of five, uh, tends to do much better. So as I mentioned, SMOD basically produces this uh, fluid description of the minority class by adding synthetic examples. And edited nearest neighbors then goes and removes the examples from the majority class that were lying on top of these. And that provides uh, a nicer uh, delineation between the two classes. And in terms of performance, this does really well on this data set. And in fact, it's the best performance um, that I was able to get uh, amongst the methods that I've tried. So in terms of precision on the majority class, it's 99%. It's better than what we had gotten with any of the other methods. And in terms of recall uh, on, the major on the minority class, again, uh, it's 92% much better than any of the other methods um, that we had. Uh, finally, I would like to uh, close with a couple of ensemble techniques. Again, this use uh, some variation of resampling but uh, uses more sophisticated classifiers. So easy ensemble is uh, an unsupervised uh, technique of uh, creating your classifier. So the idea is to take, to sample from, uh, randomly under sample from the majority class to create a class, um, to create a subset which is of the same size as the minority class. And then you learn an ADA boost ensemble classifier on this uh, data set. So let's call this classifier F sub i. You repeat this for n iterations every time you resample um, uh, uh, from the original data set, and you create n um, classifiers, and n is an hyperparameter that you can tune. And then you're just combining these classifiers additively. So I don't have a, a visualization for this, uh, because it's a different classifier that we are using. And uh, to be fair, it's not, uh, not entirely uh, uh, fair on the algorithms to compare them to each other. But here, basically, uh, the library basically gives you um, the different uh, resampled versions of the data set. Then what I'm doing is doing grid search and fitting an Adaboost classifier on each of those. And finally, uh, on the test set, I am getting the predictions from each of those individual classifiers and then just adding those and essentially averaging those. So. Uh, the original equation in the paper that appears is basically looking at the sign because uh, uh, the, the, the way they define the classes is uh, the class labels are minus one to one, and uh, the, the probabilities here essentially encode uh, classes as zero and one. So <clears throat> that, that's the only difference, but essentially it's the same idea of combining the classifiers additively. Performance is fairly good, and you get uh, often get uh, good performance with these ensemble methods, simply because there are uh, much more powerful classifiers that are going behind uh, producing these, uh, producing the final meta classifier. The performance on the precision, uh, the precision on the majority class is 98%, al almost almost the best that we have, and the recall uh, on the minority class is 90%. Again, almost the best that we have. Uh, a different technique proposed in the same paper is balanced cascade. So whereas easy ensemble chooses its subset randomly, so you choose the first subset and the second subset uh, is chosen independently of it. 
but you can do it in a more uh, supervised fashion. So after choosing the first subset and building the first ensemble, you remove all examples from your original majority class uh, that, are, that uh, are correctly classified. So in some sense, there is uh, some redundancy of information that is in your majority class. Uh, that is what Balance Cascade tries to remove. And again, you repeat this for n iterations and then combine them additively. Uh, <coughs> so, uh, yeah, there is a difference uh, in the way balance cascade is implemented in the library versus uh, how it's described in the paper, because uh, the, the library doesn't return these, uh, the, the, the classifiers that are used at each stage, and also allows you to uh, specify your own classifier. It doesn't have to be ADA boost. But uh, different uh, classifiers tend to give uh, similar performance. So here what I have done is implemented my own version of balance cascade. So on each subset that uh, the library returns, I am learning an AdaBoost classifier and then computing probabilities in the same way. So it, the code looks similar to Easy Ensemble, except that uh, the data set is uh, subsequently changed. The performance uh, is, is quite good. Uh, you get 99% precision on the majority class, the best that we have. And the recall on the minority class is 91%, which is, again, almost the best. Uh, here, uh, there is slight difference uh, compared to the previous one, where I didn't do a grid search to get the best uh, parameters, uh, just because that, that's the way it's uh, described. We, uh, that's the way uh, balance cascade uh, samples are implemented in the library. You can do grid search as well to get the best parameters, and there's not is, adds this additional line of code, or additional two lines of code. Uh, the performance is not very different. The precision on the majority class is the same. The recall on the minority class is uh, 90%. So uh, in closing, I would like to say, uh, in the spirit of the no free lunch theorem, that there is, there is no single method that's going to be a panacea to your balancing woes. You uh, basically have different methods that you can experiment with, and different methods work well with different data distributions, different classifiers, and different objectives. So this is one way um, of achieving some performance that we desire. It, it might not really be what you want to achieve on your unbalanced data set. Uh, so you'll have to experiment and see what works best for you. Uh, this is not an exhaustive list of techniques. There are a lot of other techniques that are proposed in literature. Uh, I've given some examples here. I've not really uh, explored a lot of these uh, very deeply. But uh, this, these are good starting points. Uh, all of these come from um, highly cited literature on the subject. And there are some references here which you can look up uh, when PyData. Uh, the slides will be available on PyData. Uh, finally, we only talked about one kind of imbalance here, uh, the between class imbalance. So, uh, notice uh, the very first slide where we, or uh, the very first visualization where we chose the data set to have two distinct clusters, but your, um, each of your individual classes might have several subclusters among them, and then we have to deal with uh, how the method performs with respect to each of these subclasses. Uh, so that's, that's again a different uh, area of research, and there is some, uh, some uh, techniques of how to handle that in uh, the reference that I have here. So that's all I have. Uh, if there are any questions, I can take those. Yes. Yeah, so uh, the, the problem with having a metric, uh, so the, the question is uh, having just a metric that focuses on the precision on the minority class. Uh, the problem with having a single metric uh, like that, uh, which, is, which just focuses on one class, is that you, you can cheat and basically get, uh, achieve that very easily, right? You can just label every example as the minority class, and you have 100% uh, recall there. 
Uh, there, there are ways of combining this. Like I said, you can, uh, you can combine uh, the two metrics into a single one using like something like area under the curve or something like uh, harmonic mean of these two metrics. Yeah, I don't have an immediate answer to that. Uh, again, uh, it's it's uh, really difficult to make any generalizations. Uh, you have to look at the kind of data distribution that you have and see what kind of method works for you. Question about the free lunch. So I was actually really happy and surprised to see how well the random undersampling of the mm -hmm. majority did. Mm -hmm. So I want to know in your experience at Walmart Labs, presumably you have lots of high dimensional data. I deal with a lot of high dimensional data. Mm -hmm. Do these things actually apply to that? I mean, we did, saw a nice example of lower dimensional stuff, but yeah. what, what, what actually works with high dimensional data? Yeah, so I've, I've actually had experience with uh, highly unbalanced data distribution. Um, essentially, uh, I do a lot of text mining, so the number of features tend to be in tens of thousands or even millions. And uh, I have worked with data sets where uh, the distribution is about 10 raised to 5 or something like that. Uh, uh, random undersampling actually works really well in a lot of cases. And together with uh, using the class weight parameter, if you can uh, do some cross-validation over the class weights, that, that can get you uh, quite far. Uh, in, if you have text data, in my experience, those techniques tend to be the ones that I go for. It's not uh, just about the performance, but also about training time. If you use something fancy like uh, uh, SMOT, for example, it takes forever to train on high-dimensional data sets. Uh, Yeah, exactly. I mean, uh, in, yeah, in some sense, it's free-ish lunch. Uh, it, it might not get you the, the best performance, but it might get you good enough performance that, is, uh, that gels well with your other objectives, is to have uh, classifiers that train pretty fast and are uh, easier to understand and easy uh, or fast enough to predict as well. Yeah? Uh, how how do you well, so what do you mean? Instead of trying to uh, label uh, something as a what class it is, you try to mm -hmm. assign it a floating point value. Oh, okay. Uh, so you mean the the problem is that when we are talking about some kind of undersampling or weighting of different classes, there is an inherent notion of a class in the picture. Uh, what you can do is take your underlying data set and look at the different. Uh, you can segment the data set by different features, and then depending on what kind of features that you have, uh, you might want to upweight the examples belonging to or having a particular feature. So that's uh, one way of uh, resampling the data set. Uh, again, a priori, it's hard to say how well it will do, but there is no natural notion of class there, so you'll have to manufacture one. Thank you. Thank you, Chandra.